as most of you may be aware, the swamps are no stranger to strange and creepy stories from national parks all over the country. Today's video is going to be a compilation of some of the creepiest and downright strange stories I've shared over the past few months from national parks. Some of these may be new to you and some of these you may have heard. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd appreciate seeing your stories. Before we jump right into these stories though, I need to take just a second to remind you all about Chilling. Chilling is the new home of horror, and an amazing mobile app that allows you to do things that are just not possible here on YouTube. Chilling has something that almost nothing else has. Chilling has an ambient sound menu that has new sounds being added all the time. You can change the background noise of the story at any moment you want to that will fit your mood. It's an absolute game changer. With Chilling, you get tons of professional narrators from YouTube and other places. You also get classic novels, vintage horror radio, and true crime. With over 400 stories and new stories being added all the time, from monsters, gore, paranormal, thrillers, true stories, and more, Chilling has something for everyone. There's also the recent addition of a sleep timer, an updated user interface with greater detail, and the ability to minimize the app and darken the screen. This is all completely ad-free. That's right, absolutely no ads, just endless entertainment on the Chilling app. Start your free trial today. It's only $2.99 a month after that. Again, start your free trial today with the link in the description. Now, let's get into these creepy National Park Horror Stories that'll keep you out of your local national park. The gang tag graffiti on our apartment building was the writing on the wall needed for my parents to uproot us from New York City back in the early 90s. The onslaught of gang violence in the schools was matched by the rise in teen pregnancies. Drugs were dealt openly on the streets. It was a certainty we'd end up on the wrong side of the law as lines were drawn and territories were claimed through violence and intimidation. My parents didn't have a ton of money. My dad was a handyman for an office building. My mom worked for a supermarket. They managed to save the funds needed to buy a miserable excuse for a house in the suburbs of New Jersey. It was leaps and bounds better than living in a one-bedroom apartment in a war zone. Their timing on the house was excellent, as the closing lined up with the end of the school year. We had ended up moving into the house over the summer and started school in a new district in the fall. Everything was going right in life as we coasted through until the last day of school, the day my sister died. After the bell rang, I walked into the schoolyard to meet my sister. She had waited for me to walk home together. Usually, my mother came to get us, but she was working. As I exited the building, I heard a bunch of yelling, then gunshots. I didn't realize what happened, and I froze in place. I remember watching people fall to the ground running for their lives and screaming. Then all of a sudden I felt arms wrap around me. They brought me to the ground. Everything went dark until it stopped. The only sound I heard were now the police sirens in the distance, scattered voices calling out their friends or siblings, and the moans of those injured in the fight. I didn't know how long I laid beneath my sister's corpse. Someone pulled her off of me. I think it was a cop or a paramedic. I don't know for certain... My memory is hazy here. All I can recall is seeing my sister lying on the ground with her eyes wide open, unmoving, unbreathing. A stray bullet had struck her and killed her. A shot meant for me. We buried my sister at a cemetery near our new home so we could visit her without ever having to return to that city again. And we never did. There wasn't any excitement over moving into our new home. It felt empty and wrong to be there without her. Her bedroom sat empty, never to be filled. We all mourned for her the rest of our lives, especially me. For the rest of my life, I have had nightmares about that same day. At the sounds of the fireworks going off, I'd be back in that moment and have panic attacks. I blamed myself for her death, even if everyone told me it wasn't my fault. 
If it hadn't been for me, she would be alive. I often contemplated suicide, but never went through with it because I didn't want my parents to endure the death of another child. I did cut myself though. I went on antidepressants, went to therapy, and the whole nine yards to try to get help, but nothing ever made me feel right. They told me it was post-traumatic stress, survivor's guilt. I carried this burden around for decades until I visited Yellowstone National Park. At the suggestion of one of my therapists, I took up hiking as a hobby to get myself out of the house, physically active, and to gain a new perspective on the world around me. It was after a business trip to California that I decided to take time off to check out Yellowstone. On previous trips, I'd been to Yosemite, so I wanted to check out something different this time. My heart was set on checking the Thoroughfare and South Boundary Trail. My heart was set on checking out the Thoroughfare and South Boundary Trail, but I could not find anyone willing to come with me. I decided to take the trip solo, since I would likely not be able to get out to Yellowstone again for a long while. The first few days were uneventful. I followed the trail, took pictures, and made camp when the sun started to set. The next day, I'd wake up with the sunrise and continue my journey onward. Let me tell you, the earth is magnificent when humans aren't around to mess everything up. The streams and rivers flowed with water so clear you could see to the bottom. Mountains loomed in the distance, towering over forests. It makes a person understand how insignificant they are in the world. It felt like trespassing into the Garden of Eden. After a long day, I reached Mariposa Lake and called it a day. Setting up camp did not take too long. Dinner went without a hitch. Exhausted, I settled into the tent for the night, set the alarm for sunrise, and allowed my exhaustion to carry me off into sleep. Honestly, I don't know how long I slept before I woke up to what sounded like a voice speaking outside of my tent. It sounded close, yet I could not make out any of the words. It startled me away as it was something completely unexpected. Seeing other hikers along the way wasn't something rare, but to have someone approach my camp in the middle of the night did not leave me feeling good. It was the middle of September. The temperature was close to 30 degrees that night. For someone to travel in the near complete darkness of such cold and darkness, they must have either been in trouble or looking to cause trouble. A folding shovel was the closest thing I had to a weapon. Rooting around the inside of my tent, I tried to find where I'd left it. I did not dare turn on the light as I did not want the intruder to know I was awake. I realized it didn't make sense right away. If someone wanted to hurt me, they wouldn't have announced themselves to keep the element a surprise. As soon as this realization hit me, I felt the cold bite of carbon steel and wrapped my hand around the handle. The voice spoke up again. This time it was closer, only a few feet outside the tent. Prepared to greet or fight my new companion, I unzipped the flap and quickly looked outside. A thick, roiling fog enveloped my campsite. Visibility close to nothing as it seemed to swallow reality like a floating gray ocean of mist. The silence around did not help matters either. I did not hear any footsteps or the crunching of grass or soil. All I heard was the sound of my heart beating in my ears and the quickening of my breath. Again, I heard the voice speak out from just beyond the fog. As it spoke, sparks of blue electricity flashed through the fog. It became clearer. It was a woman's voice. It sounded familiar, but I couldn't quite place it. I called out into the fog, telling the person to follow my voice to my campsite. I got no response. I called out again asking if anyone was injured. This time, the voice replied as if it were right beyond the edge of the fog, still obscured yet close enough to be heard. The voice was clear this time. It requested I meet just beyond the fog. As it told me to come, the blue electrical spark spread open, a path through the mist. I did not move. My mind went back to my childhood. I saw my sister's face. I heard her voice in my mind telling me that I was annoying her. It was my sister's voice. Of course, that didn't make sense. She died decades ago. I was dreaming. I had to be. 
but I just knew I wasn't. I yanked my boots on, charged out of my tent into the fog, and I called out my sister's name, feeling insanely stupid to think it was really her out here. Maybe it was a woman who had a voice very oddly similar. This self-doubt dematerialized as I heard her voice again further up ahead. She called my name over and over again, desperately. With each word, the blue lightning flashed and the fog cleared. I broke out into a sprint. Memories of the shooting flooded my mind. I was a child standing there in the schoolyard watching helplessly as the gun battle broke out. At this point, I'm fighting against my instinct to freeze in place again. My sister's voice ringing in my ears, calling out my name, telling me to get down. It's what I heard in the fog. Her voice calling out my name once again. I hit the edge of Mariposa Lake. The fog cleared up and a dozen yards up the shore I saw a man standing on a rowboat. His gaze bore into me. His will demanded I present myself before him. Its sheer strength and dominance pushed me forward. I felt outside myself, watching the scene unfold without control. My mind and body bent to this man's determination. My sister's voice spoke from the lake, saying soothing words and reassuring me that all would be okay. Approaching the man sitting on the boat, I feel as if he is looking down upon me. It is now I realized he was not a man at all. He is something in the shape of a man. This conventional form hid the truth of his supremacy. The man doesn't move his lips to speak. His thoughts came directly into my mind. He had knowledge of the universe and all creation. He knew my entire life from start and to finish. He showed me the end. At least, one way it was supposed to end. It was meant for me to die in that schoolyard. My sister trips over another student's book and falls to the ground. She doesn't make it to where I'm standing. She watches the bullet hit me in the chest, and my tiny body falls backward onto the pavement, dead. The world goes dark, life ends, life continues. Back at Mariposa Lake, the man waved me over toward the boat. I joined him aboard. He stands and pushes off the shore with his paddle. There is no splash when the boat enters the water. Hundreds of hands reach out from the depths of the lake. Their skins are pale white. Their fingers pruned and waterlogged, reminding me of coiled maggots. They're holding the boat above the water and passing it along like a crowd surfer at a concert. More and more hands reaching out ahead of us, carrying us forward to the middle of the lake. When we reached our destination, the hands stopped moving us and rested beneath the boat, holding it in place. The man removed the paddle from the water, then retook his seat. To our right... The water churned violently as the hands swam in a circle, creating a whirlpool. Within this maelstrom, I saw bodies, hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of bodies swirled downward into the lake. Their faces were placid and serene, like babies sleeping in their mother's womb. It made me jealous. I wanted to join them in their eternal soggy slumber. I set my foot on the side of the boat. With a single push, I join those gentle souls underneath and carry the man's boat forever. Just as I had made up my mind, the man reached out with a skeletal hand and dragged me back to my seat. He let me know this was not the purpose for which he was bringing me to this place. My sister's voice then called out from inside the whirlpool. At first I saw the little girl who saved my life standing before me upon a platform made of waterlogged and bloated corpses. Then within a blink of an eye I saw a teenage girl then a young woman, a middle-aged woman, and finally, an elderly senior. She was all of these and none of these. She did not live. This is all that could have been and never was. My sister's voice pulled me from my thoughts and set me at ease. Her incorporeal form glowed in electric blue, as did the water and the fog surrounding the lake. It was beautiful and hideous. Our conversation did not last long. It was not something that was supposed to happen. In the grand scheme of the universe, there is a firm line between the world of the living and the dead. For her to return to this plane of existence, only to speak so briefly, was a gift from the cosmos. Or perhaps I had lost my mind after all these years of medication, therapy, and living with the pain of guilt. Once again, she took care of me when it mattered the most. 
She told me her death was not my fault. The guilt, the shame, the regret I felt throughout my life was misplaced. Her decision to shield me from the bullet was a sacrifice she would make over and over again. It was the best decision of her short life. She now rested with those beneath the waves in peace. With those final words, all the versions of my sister which never existed gave me a smiling goodbye before the platform of corpses descended back into the whirlpool. The maelstrom collapsed and the lake returned to its normal state once more. My sister was gone again, this time for good. The man stood from his seat and once more the hands reached out to carry us back to shore. Once again on Terraforma, the man told me to go straight back to my camp or else I'd be lost in the fog forever. He also tells me to leave Yellowstone the way I'd come in. I departed from the shore and dared not look back at the man or Mariposa Lake. The fog no longer crackled with electricity, blue or otherwise. The alarm rang right as the sun rose. I felt tired, emotionally drained, and bewildered about the previous night. I did not remember falling asleep. How could anyone sleep after that? My mind was racing. My adrenaline was pumping. When did I fall asleep? When I came out of the tent, the fog had vanished. The wilderness surrounded me again. There wasn't a single cloud in the sky. Still, I heeded the man's warning and packed up my encampment. I headed back down in the direction from where I had left. The nice weather did not last long as rain showers doused the landscape. The freezing cold rain soaked me from head to toe. Visibility was downright awful. Even with the proper gear, it still wasn't easy. I wanted to camp a few times to wait out the rains, but I felt the man's warning to leave Yellowstone meant sooner rather than later. My rental car was the only vehicle in the parking lot when I arrived back to civilization. I tossed my belongings in the trunk and immediately headed for the airport. I have not returned to Yellowstone National Park since. I think I've gotten the most out of that place as I can. I never told anyone this happened to me. I didn't want them to think I was taking drugs or losing my mind. There's enough stigma against people with mental health issues. Plus, that message was solely for me. I've not hiked anywhere since then, but I'm dying to get out there again and see more of the world. There are a lot of other places to explore, enjoy, and experience. You never know how much time you have left in this world before it's your turn to fall in with those beneath the waters. Something is wrong with the Yellowstone National Park. Nothing could have prepared me for what happened. Not the hundreds of hours of classroom learning. All the practical training exercises in the world were for nothing. A squadron. A fighter jets may have stood a chance, but I doubt it. What I encountered six years ago was an unstoppable force of nature, like a tsunami or a volcano eruption. If you're caught in its path, you're dead. Lucky for me, I survived. It was sheer luck that I did. This is a warning. Stay out of Yosemite National Park. Six years ago, I was a mounted patrol ranger. On that day, Buckley, my Mustang Stallion, and I were on patrol near Tulum Meadows when I noticed a man approaching us in the distance. He waved his arms at us frantically and collapsed to the ground. He clutched his chest and struggled to catch his breath. His mouth was wide open as he gasped for air. I thought he might have been having an asthma attack and kicked Buckley into a sprint. As we came closer, I immediately noticed blood on his shirt, but he didn't appear to be wounded. He cried out for help as I jumped off Buckley and went to see if there was anything I could do while I radioed for medical assistance. Before he could catch his breath, the man incoherently told me something about his son being injured and something about a tour group. I told him to concentrate on catching his breath so he could tell me what was happening more clearly. Once he was able to speak, he introduced himself as Greg. He told me what happened with his tour group. Honestly, I couldn't believe it until I experienced it for myself. 
He said they'd been on a guided tour in the woods nearby, and everything was fine until there were a series of explosions among the tour group. Greg said his son's cell phone had exploded in his pocket, and his wife's digital camera had blown to pieces inside the carrying case. All of their electronic devices had blown up, including the tour guide's radio. He also mentioned that a man had collapsed on the spot and remained unresponsive. Of course, his main concern was for his son. He said shards from the phone were lodged in his leg, and he suffered burns. They tried to tend to the wounds before he came running for help. I relayed the information back to the base, requesting medical assistance on my position once Greg led me back to the injured group. While I didn't like to ride Dubbo on Buckley, time was of the essence. Greg was far too exhausted to allow him to continue on foot. The tour group could not have been too far away if he had made it to me. Buckley could handle the weight, and we needed to get there as soon as possible. He likely would have died of a heart attack if I didn't give him a ride. Perhaps that would have been a mercy compared to how he died later on. We rode alongside the stream heading directly to the tree line in the distance. The path was familiar, as it was a popular destination for a moderate hike. Greg showed me where to go. As we came closer to the trees, I felt a rising warmth on my side, exactly where my radio was attached to my belt. Remembering what Greg told me earlier about the electronics, I immediately reached down and removed the radio from my holster. It felt like it had been under the sun for hours. It was so damned hot. It burned the palm of my hand, and I dropped it to the side. Upon hitting the ground, it sparked before it exploded. Buckley got startled at the sound and bucked. I comforted him as best as I could while charging ahead. The further into the woods we went, Buckley became more agitated. He bucked hard, nearly tossing Greg and me off of him. It wasn't like Buckley to not follow commands. He had been trained for the service since he was a colt. The further I tried to force him to continue, the more he fought until I decided to leave him behind. Buckley fought like crazy when I tried to tie him to a tree. There wasn't much I could do against a 3,500 pound horse. If he wanted to leave, he was going to leave. In a last ditch effort, I tried to pull him and the rein slipped from my hand. Buckley turned back in the direction we had come from and disappeared into the woods. He'd probably ran back all the way to the stable like he was trained to do. Admittedly, this left me feeling a bit shaken. As we trekked through the woods, Greg asked if I had any idea what was happening, and I didn't really have an answer for him. Buckley getting spooked, I could understand, something unnerved him. Something which Greg and I couldn't sense. But he could feel from the moment we entered those woods, exploding electronics was not something we were taught about in training. As I said earlier, nothing in the world could have prepared me for what came that day. Nothing. When I made myself known, I was immediately ambushed by several tourists. They all spoke at once requesting help for their loved ones. Being swarmed by everyone asking questions and asking for assistance did not help with the situation at all. From what I could see, most of the injured sustained burns and lacerations were probably not life-threatening. What really worried me was the unresponsive man Greg mentioned earlier. Through the crowd, I saw a woman sitting off to the side with a thousand-yard stare in her eyes. She sat against a tree, alone next to a heavy-set man face down on the ground. I insisted on attending the man who clearly wasn't recovering or moving or showing any signs of life. From what I could tell, he wasn't even breathing. I ran over to the man and checked for a pulse while asking his companion if she felt okay. She didn't respond, and I could see why. There was no pulse. The man was dead. Falling back on my training... I immediately went and started the chest compressions. I reached underneath the man's side to flip him over, and my hands were immediately met with warmth and wetness. When I turned him over, I immediately jumped in surprise. My hands were covered in blood. There was a hole in the man's chest where his heart would have been if it hadn't exploded. I saw pieces of wire and metal surrounding the mangled meat of the wound. At the confirmation that her companion was indeed dead, the woman wailed so loudly everyone turned their attention to her. 
between her sobs and scream, she only said one word, which I understood. Pacemaker. Seeing there was a casualty, I called out for someone to hand me something to cover the deceased face. No one moved or made a noise aside from the woman grieving her dead companion. It was here I noticed the absolute silence surrounding us. Usually, there are signs of life all around us making noises. Birds chirping, bugs buzzing, frogs croaking. It was at that moment I realized we were in danger, more than we knew. It was silent around us because the animals had either run away like Buckley had, or they remained silent to hide from what scared them. Whatever was happening, I needed everyone to get out of the woods quickly. I commanded the non-injured to assist the wounded and help them start walking out of the woods. One of the women in the group asked why I didn't just radio for help. I told her my radio had blown up and we needed to get out of here as fast as possible. Now, if you've ever done anything in life with a group of people, you'll understand that getting them to follow directions is damned near impossible. One person wants to fight back on anything you tell them because they don't respect authority. Another person yells at the person to comply. Those two start a fight. You have another person who starts doing their own thing. You have others following them. Groups split off into other groups and, you know, it kind of just becomes a big mess. In this case, we didn't even get the chance to start fighting each other. As I tried to get everyone moving, a blast of lightning ripped across the blackening sky above us. It struck a tree only a few hundred yards away. Then the wind picked up lifting leaves and dust and debris through the air. The weather report for the week was clear, sunny skies with no chance of precipitation. This development unnerved me as I looked up to the clouds overhead and saw how deeply dark and ominous and out of place and alien these clouds were in the sky. Buried somewhere within the primitive part of my brain, I recognized something was amiss in this isolated pocket of our world. It must have hit the others in the group as well, as some of them stopped and stared into the sky, petrified and frozen in place, awaiting their demise. Others rushed to grab their loved ones and drag them to safety. Still, others just abandoned the group in utter terror with nothing but instinct of self-preservation dominating the otherwise civilized and evolved parts of their being. What came next, I still see it whenever it storms. First, Another eruption of lightning tore the sky asunder, nearly deafening me with its turbulent force. Then, in the electrical firebolt streaking across the sky, I saw the silhouette of a massive winged creature flying through the air. With each thrust of its colossal wings, it produced bolts of lightning crackling across the sky in all directions. I was glued to the spot staring up at it through the tops of the trees and branches in awe. As the creature circled the sky above, with each flash and crackle of lightning, the sky filled with smaller versions of the beast surrounding their brood mother. It was at this moment I realized that this is what had spooked Buckley and all the other animals. They knew this creature was coming and ran for their lives. Our exploding electronics were our warning, Nothing as deep-seated as animal instinct, but a warning nonetheless. After witnessing this, I am ashamed to admit that I gave in to the part of me hell-bent on self-preservation and started to run away from the woods. But unfortunately, many others had already been running away, leaving behind those who tried to help their injured friends and family. If I had tried to help anyone at this point, I would have likely joined them in death. As I ran into the woods, I saw someone running in front of me rise into the air as if the invisible hand of God plucked them from the ground. There wasn't any time to process what I had just seen. I felt a sudden lurch beneath my feet, and I too was airborne. My first crazed thought was to assume one of those creatures had swept me off the ground. However, as the world spun, I realized nothing was holding on to me. Instinctively, I reached out and tried to take hold of a tree branch but I couldn't get a grasp as they slipped through my hands and I went further into the air. This happened at least a dozen more times until I finally grabbed hold tightly to a branch and managed to pull myself to the trunk. I still felt the force of being pulled upward as I held on and didn't let go until the whole thing was over 
and the creatures were gone. But I'm jumping ahead here. From my position, I had a clear view of what was happening. Unfortunately, the others hadn't been as lucky as I was. They continued to float into the air, spinning around, screaming, and reaching out like a doomed astronaut, untethered and floating into the vastness of outer space. It wasn't only other people either. There were deer, birds, and several other animals caught in the same trap. All of them floated through the air, high above the trees, and stopped their heavenly ascent at the same point. With one final screech from their brood mother, the smaller creatures circled through the air once and swooped down to enjoy their meal. Humans, animals, insects, whatever managed to float to that invisible line in the sky was consumed. The sound of their screeches and squawks masked the screams. I turned my head away, holding it against the tree, and tightening my grip on the tree trunk for dear life. I didn't know if these creatures would notice one of their snacks had gone missing. Maybe they'd sweep down into the trees and I'd be done for. But of course they didn't. I cannot guess for how long I stayed in the tree, but once the screeches and squawks stopped, I no longer heard any screams, and gravity felt as if it had returned, and I braved a look to the sky. It was clear of any monsters or dark clouds. Nothing or no one floated in the air against the laws of gravity. The setting sun of dusk returned to its rightful place, dominating the sky and extinguishing the last remnants of the light in the day. All had returned to normal, except for my state of mind. I climbed down the tree, slowly and steadily as my muscles ached. Once I reached the ground, I sat down and allowed myself to rest. My mind was reeling. My body was thrashed. I closed my eyes for what felt like a minute, maybe just two, and awakened to a paramedic shaking me awake. Moments later, I was carted off in an ambulance and treated for my wounds. Of course, there were tons of questions as to what happened afterwards. The whole incident was chalked up to a random, freak tornado happening in the area, and the tour group was wiped out in the resulting storm. According to the authorities on the scene, there were dark clouds over the section of the woods and they saw a massive cone touch down. As far as I was concerned, I let them tell whatever story they wanted to make it all go away. It's not like anyone would believe me anyway. Not long after the incident, I decided to quit being a park ranger and moved to Philadelphia to live with some family for a while before getting back on my feet again. I just couldn't stand the thought of being in the forest anymore after seeing what I saw. So, when it storms, I run for cover indoors and stay away from windows. I drown myself in alcohol and take a few extra Xanax to avoid the inevitable thoughts which creep into my mind right before I go to sleep. But in my nightmares, I'm always back to Yosemite. Buckley and I on patrol, and we see Greg coming toward us in need of help. Around Thanksgiving of 1969, I had just gotten a job as an entry-level reporter for the Post Standard, the local newspaper here in Syracuse. I was young. I had my dream job. Life was good. But just six weeks later, my entire world came crashing down around me with the arrival of one little letter. To Daniel Frederick Wilson, you are hereby ordered for induction to the armed forces of the United States. I had been drafted, and although I'd make a dozen stops at various induction centers, training facilities, and Air Force bases, I was ultimately destined for one place, Vietnam. What followed was eight weeks of boot camp over at Fort Dix, and for a while, it looked like I was doomed to join the infantry. But due to my degree in journalism, there was a chance I might be able to weasel my way onto the writing staff of Stars and Stripes. Then, just a few days before we were due to graduate, my drill sergeant pulls me into his office with some bad news. Stars and Stripes did not need any more bodies, but there was an opportunity for me to become a military dog handler. It wouldn't keep me out of the field completely, but according to him, 
All I'd have to do was roll up with my canine, sniff out a few booby traps, and after that, the engineers would roll up, and I'd be back in the rear in a hot minute. But as it turned out, all that stuff about being safely in the rear turned out to be a bunch of bull, because me and Tack, my three-year-old German Shepherd, ended up in more firefights than I could have possibly imagined. Tack got his name after a particularly close call that occurred on a routine patrol near Kuchi. We're on point when suddenly, Tack, who was called Rex back then, started alerting like crazy. I had never seen him act so downright scared before, and when the lieutenant sees this, he orders his guys to unload their weapons onto the jungle ahead of us. What followed was nothing short of a lead storm, with 556, 30 cal, and 40 Mike Mike just tearing up foliage in front of us for a solid minute. When the fire finally stopped, nothing moved, and there was a moment where we thought the whole thing might have been a false alarm. But sure enough, as we pushed through the jungle, we found drag marks, bloody trails, booby traps, the works. If it was not for Tack, there's a chance the entire platoon would have been wiped out. He saved our lives. God dang, boy. I remember this one grunt saying, the hound of yours is sharp as a tack, isn't it? And it just sort of stuck. Tack sniffed out every single ambush we ever came up against. Even the one that almost killed him. Some poor grunt managed to snag a tripwire connected to a 125mm tank shell. I don't even really remember the blast. I just remember waking up on my back with someone dragging me back through the jungle. My first thought was, for Tack, and as I looked to tell the soldier dragging me to go back for my canine, I saw that it wasn't a soldier at all. It was Tack. He had one of my shoulder straps between his teeth and was dragging me back towards the relative safety of the platoon with all his might. We were putting out a lot of fire, but Charlie was giving as good as they got, and one burst of a machine gun fire ripped up the ground in front of me before I watched a piece of my fatigue pants just pop open. I let out a scream loud enough to wake the dead, begging for the platoon's medic. Only, the next thing I know, I hear Tack let out this almighty yelp before he dived on top of me. I had no idea what just happened, and for a second, I thought he had been shot, but he had not. He was trying to shield me from the bullets. The poor little guy had no idea how the enemy were hurting me. All he knew is that he wanted it to stop, even if it meant putting his body in the way of their bullets. I tried to push him off of me. I tried to keep crawling, but he wouldn't budge, and only when the shooting died down could I shift him. But that time, instead of getting to his feet, Tack just slumped down next to me. He was alive, just barely, and I said that the platoon commander, if he didn't put him on the medic vac with me, that I'd make sure he never received canine support again. It was a total bluff, but it sure worked. Yet, it takes some considerable amount of time and insubordination to save Tack's life. When we landed back at Dak 2, I carried Tack off the Huey myself before hopping over the medical tent to demand one of the surgeons save his life. Get that mutt off my operating table, soldier, one of them said. I'm a doctor for Christ's sakes, not a veterinarian. I didn't say a word in response. I just pulled out my 45, pulled back the slide, and then pointed it at his head. The surgeon looked at me in the eyes and saw months of firefights, booby traps, and night patrols staring back at him. A moment of silence followed, and then the surgeon got to work saving Tack's life. I'm sure you'll be as pleased as I am to learn that he survived. Turned out to be nothing more than a few shrapnel wounds, and although it took him a while to get back on his feet, Tack did make a full recovery. The incident left the brass in a predicament. I know there was at least one lieutenant colonel who wanted me breaking rocks in Leavenworth, but then there was another who was in the middle of writing me up for a bronze star for having saved the lives of half of his battalion. In the end, their decision was more political than disciplinary. Rather than risk angering the rest of the dog handlers in country, the brass just scratched my bronze star and gave me a medical discharge instead. I couldn't have cared less about some janky metal because I left Vietnam with the one thing that really mattered to me. Due to the wounds he'd sustained in combat, Tack had to be scrapped from the military's dog program, and it looked like he was headed back to the dog pound back in the US, unless of course, I stepped in to take ownership of him. That's how I ended up back in Syracuse with my best friend in the world. I was an unemployed 24-year-old with a bum leg and a bad case of PTSD, but... 
I didn't care because I had attack with me. It took me just short of a year to get back on my feet, and fortunately, I ended up picking up where I left off at the Post Standard after a chance meeting with the editor. I'll be forever grateful to him for giving me that opportunity, and with the structure and steady income it brought, I gradually got my life together. Then, one day he called me into his office with the proposition of a lifetime. Some editor friend of a friend in DC needed an article written, only the prospective author had just taken ill and couldn't make the assignment. Struggling to find a replacement, he'd fruitlessly called up to their New York desk, which is how it made its way to us. What's the subject? I remember asking. You ever heard of those churches down in Kentucky that handle snakes during their services? A little, I replied. I thought it was illegal. Since when did the law stop anyone from doing anything, kid? True, but who's this piece for? National Geographic, he said, a smile stretching across his face. I wouldn't want to go ahead and jinx you by saying this is your big break, but I think we both know what this is. The drive down to Appalachia was going to be one son of a bitch, but since the newspaper was covering my gas money and Tack was used to being on the move, there was nothing stopping me from getting on the road the very next morning. The drive down to Kentucky was a nine and a half hours of watching featureless suburban sprawl slowly erupt into the green rolling hills of the Appalachia, and by the time we got there, my ass was in a coma. Tack did not seem to mind the journey though. Every so often he'd stick his head out the passenger side window to renew his spirit. That, and when it came to provisions, I had little choice but to buy him a burger at the roadside grease trap, onions, mustard, and all. We rolled into Lexington late afternoon, and to my surprise, getting information on snake handling churches wasn't all that difficult. All it took was a few pictures of Budweiser down at the VFW, and I had those crusty old veterans singing like canaries. They told me I'd have to look out on the eastern side of the state if I wanted to talk to any of the old snake handlers, and given that the practice was outlawed, finding them was certainly not going to be easy. That didn't bother me, though. After all, I had Tack with me, and we were used to finding things that did not want to be found. One guy said he hadn't heard of anyone handling snakes in years, but last time he did, it was happening at the old church up in the hills. And so, I set out for the eastern Kentucky hills, with nothing but the name of a small hillside hamlet called Three Forks. The next morning, I was back on the road driving in the direction of West Virginia, somewhere by the state line. By around four hours in, it felt like I had not just traveled 200 miles. It felt like I traveled back in time by around 50 years, too. It was everything. The old Hudson trucks, dated-looking signage, and by the time I was out near Three Forks, the roads had degenerated into nothing, but dirt tracks flanked by dense, dark woods. Every so often, these claustrophobia-inducing country roads would open up into what the locals call hollows, relatively flat areas where the road is sandwiched by homes and small businesses. Frog Pond Hollow was home to the Rabbit's Foot General Store, a place that doubled as both the Hollow's gas station and barber shop. And as I pulled in to top up my gas tank, the clerk wandered out to greet me. Not often we see New York plates around here, he said, eyeing me suspiciously from across the forecourt. I explained I was in the area on business and that I'd appreciate some gas and a bite to eat. For a buck fifty, the guy brought me a plate of something he called corn pone pie, which was basically cornbread with beef chili filling, along with a plate of raw hamburger for tack. After I complimented his cooking, he nodded in appreciation before correcting me that it was his wife's, and that I told him he was a lucky man to have such a fine cook at home. He finally began to warm up to me a little. When he asked what kind of business I was on, I didn't want to spoil all the goodwill by telling him that I was a reporter, charged with writing a story on a neighboring community that would well end with them being arrested, so I broke it to him gently. The instant he heard that I was there to write an article about snake handling, I could tell he felt almost tricked into talking to me. Sir, please hear me out. I just want to tell these people stories, I countered. This country was founded on the promise of religious freedom and the fact that snake handlers can be arrested for practicing their faith is frankly un-American. So please help me show the world that these are good people here, 
Help me get these people their rights back. I fought for this country's freedom in South Vietnam, and damn it, I'll fight for them here too. I think it was the last line that got him. He gave me another look over, then mentioned for me to follow him inside. According to the clerk, almost everyone in the Appalachian knew of at least one church that still took up serpents, as he put it, and it came to no surprise that those who practice it were still persecuted by the state. Three Forks had been the subject of a crackdown on snake handling in the mid-50s after their pastor almost lost his life to a rattlesnake bite. Since then, they'd taken their rather unique form of worship underground, but a more pertinent question than where are they now was how in the hell did their pastor survive the bite of an eastern diamondback, a snake whose venom is almost 100% fatal when untreated. Victims described the pain of being bitten by one as like two red-hot hypodermic needles piercing your skin and the venom causing the flesh surrounding the bite to blacken and rot. Even worse, the intense swelling of the affected area is said to be one of the worst forms of pain imaginable. But snake handlers vow never to seek medical attention or take any kind of painkillers in the event that they're bitten. Instead, they put their survival in God's hands. Sometimes, he comes through for them, others not. I asked the clerk if he knew of any local snake bite fatalities, but he just shook his head. They'd get bitten all right. Not often, but they do. But the way I hear it, they always seem to pull through for some reason. Who knows, maybe the Lord really is looking out for them. It's then that I asked how I'd go about securing an invite to one of these snake handling services. The clerk just looked at me, asked what unit I served with, and then once I confirmed, he'd walked into the back to make a phone call. When he re-emerged, he held a small, torn-off piece of paper in his hand, one with the following note written on it. Walk into the woods off Laurel Fork after dark. No pictures. It was all the information he had for me, but it was all I needed. That night, once the sun had fully set, me and Tack walked out of the small Inez Motel where we were staying at, got into my car, and drove back down to Three Forks. The darkness gave the overgrown, rust-eaten place an ominous feel, and the closer we got to Laurel Fork, the more anxious I got. By the time we reached the dead end of Laurel Fork, and I switched on the old flashlight I kept in the glove box, I'm not afraid to admit I was downright scared. It was the first time that me and Tack had gotten anywhere in the dark in an unfamiliar area since Nam, but there was something else to do something I could not quite put my finger on until the following night. Like I said, I was so nervous that Tack could sense it, and he stayed glued to my heel for most of the walk. Then, after a few minutes of trudging through the darkness, I began to hear something. Something that sounded almost like singing. Moments later, I saw a dim light shining from beyond the trees, somewhere in the distance. I got a little closer, then realized what I was looking at. It was the shape of a large revival tent, set up in a small clearing, and the light was coming from the lantern of a dark, shadowy figure. Since I figured they were expecting me, I switched my flashlight back on, then slowly began to approach with Tack by my side. Welcome, brother, the figure said. I trust you've adhered to the terms of our agreement. Yes, sir, I replied. No cameras, just me and my dog. Good, the stranger replied. Now come meet Pastor Childers. As he lifted a tent flap, I was met with a surprising sight. I had gotten into my head that these folks were some serpentine death cult, yet they seemed just like any other small town congregation in America. A guy was plucking a guitar at the head of the congregation, while the worshippers sang a cheerful melody of, When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm going to get up out the ground. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Once the musical numbers ceased, the congregation applauded the banjo player before a very distinctive looking man took the stage. He was pale and stick thin, with a shock of curly red hair and a fiery mustache, wearing white button down and black slacks. As soon as he came into view, Tack's ears shot up and he softly began to growl. Brothers and sisters, the man began to bellow. We welcome an esteemed guest in our humble house of worship tonight. The announcement prompted a handful of worshippers to shoot a welcoming smile at me. 
He's come all the way down here to the holler tonight from New York City. He talked about the place like it could have just as easily been Mars. But he isn't no federal man coming to take away your rights. He's come to show all those tyrants in Washington that what we are doing isn't harming anybody down here in God's house. Isn't that right, brothers and sisters? The congregation erupted in whoops and cheers of approval. And in a way, he was right. If folks were dying because they were dancing with rattlesnakes, that was undeniably tragic. But no one was forcing them to, and they weren't exactly going out of their way to hurt anyone. So for me, it really did raise the question, do we live in a free country or not? The pastor continued with his sermon for a spell. Then, after ushering in another musical number, walked down the center row of seats to greet me. But as he got within arm's reach, Tack exploded in a flurry of furious barks. Tack, I growled at him. Quiet boy. But Tack just would not stop. He barked so loud and so intensely that some of the warshippers were turning to us with angry looks on their faces. Brother, I really must insist you tie that thing up outside, Pastor Childress said, his cheerful demeanor slipping a little as he spoke. Normally, if someone spoke about Tack like that, I'd tell them to kick a rock. But this was work so I made an exception. I took Tack outside and asked what the hell had gotten into him. Then, for the first time since the day we had both been wounded in combat, he alerted. There were no booby traps here, no Viet Cong to worry about, but he still told me danger was present. I was concerned, but I had not come too far just to turn back. I told him to stay and assured him I'd be back in a moment. Tack laid down, shooting me a frightened look, but did as he was told. Must be that he can smell the snake on me, the pastor said when I re-entered the tent. At the time, that made all the sense in the world to me, and since he had given me a conversational window into asking him about snakes, I took the initiative. My snakes really bite, he said, with a warm smile. They sure got the devil in them, all serpents do, but Satan's power is weakest here in the Lord's house. However, on the occasion they do bite, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That being said, he broke off, turning his neck to one side, revealing two dark pinprick scars upon his throat. To my knowledge, no one had ever been survived by being bitten on the neck by an eastern diamondback. Yet here stood this pastor, living, breathing proof that it was possible. Only, that wasn't quite his version of events. When I asked him how he survived, his response was cryptic, to say the least. That's just the thing, brother, he said. I didn't. When I asked him what he meant by that, the pastor called out to one of his congregations. Brother Robert, he yelled, show our guest here how we are unafraid. I watched in disbelief as a boy no older than twenty fetched a wicker basket from one side of the stage before pulling out the biggest rattlesnake I'd ever laid eyes on. Then in rhythm with singing and clapping of the congregation, he starts bouncing this thing up and down in his grip. I expected that the rattler would just wheel around and bite him in an instant, but to my amazement, it looked completely disinterested. My jaw is on the floor as I am trying to figure out if it's the music, the rhythmatic bouncing, or if these snakes have been sedated before the service, and I only snap out of it when I hear the pastor speak again. You see, brother, he hissed into my ear, you see how we got the devil on a leash? I must admit, I was impressed balls for picking up a rattlesnake like that, but it didn't seem the least bit interested in biting him. I had to drag myself out of that awestruck stupor to get the interview back on track. I finally asked him what he meant when he said he didn't survive the snake bite. He just looked at me and grinned, his lips squirming like the truth was on the tip of his tongue, but all that came out was a Bible verse. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. My first guess was that Pastor Childers hadn't died. More like he had miraculously survived a period of unfathomable pain and suffering and lost a little of his sanity in the process. But Pastor Childers was telling the truth. Only before I could question him any further, one of the congregations let out an ear-piercing screech. Another worshiper rushed to take control of the rattler Brother Robert had been holding. While the boy himself held out his forearm, two tiny droplets of blood bubbling out before running down his alabaster skin. He had been bitten. You excuse me, brother, 
Pastor Childers said as pandemonium erupted. But please, come back tomorrow night. If the boy doesn't survive, he'll be resurrected. Come see, come see. And at that, he was gone, sucked into the throng of hysterical warshippers as they flocked around the venom-stricken boy. I left disgusted at the waste of a young life, switching on my flashlight as I walked back into the darkness. Come on, boy, let's get out of here. Tack jumped up, his tail wagging in relief before we trudged off through the trees. When I awoke the next morning, I had no intention of returning to the revival tent to watch Brother Robert's resurrection. I had seen enough medics hopelessly laboring over dead men to know that once you're gone, there's no bringing you back. Instead, I planned to check out the motel before the long drive back to Syracuse. Only as I was loading up my car, I heard a soft, mousy voice calling out from behind me. Hey, mister. It was a young woman, maybe about 16 or even 17 years old. You're headed down to the warship tonight, right? I hadn't noticed her the night before, but evidently, she had noticed me. Uh, no, I replied. I don't know what they're going to do with that boy, but he, he passed. She interjected, a sadness in her eyes. Last night, a few hours after you left, but they're going to bring him back tonight. She believed it too. You could hear her voice. I'm sorry, but you can't bring people back. I felt like a major D-bag saying it to her, but it was the truth. At least I thought it was. Your pastor is a liar. He wasn't resurrected. There's no such thing. Sure there is, mister, and you're going to tell everyone about it. I slammed my trunk shut and turned to face her. And why would you want me to tell everyone? I asked. That'll mean feds crawling all over these hills. They'll rest your pastor and take a snake's because it needs to stop. All of it needs to stop. She was growing more increasingly agitated, and her voice cracked as she spoke. What they're doing down there? It's, it's wrong, sure. Most of the time, they come back okay. But every so often, they come back different, and they got to put them down. I don't want to see Robert like that. I just can't, but they're going to, and... And... Okay. I said, cutting her off before she descended into panic. I'll head down to the tent again, tonight, and try to stop whatever they're going to do, okay? Thank you, mister. Thank you, the girl replied, her cheeks now slick with tears. Before I had a chance to say anything else, she was on her way. That night, me and Tack repeated the ritual of gearing up, getting in the car, and driving down to Three Forks. Only this time, I had even less of an idea of what to expect. We had hit the dead end of Laurel Fork, and again, walked through the drizzling rain towards where the tent had been the night before. Once again, they were expecting me, but when I entered, I found the tone to be very different than the night before. Instead of singing, dancing, and clapping, the congregation was silent, and there was a distinct tension in the air. Ah, Pastor Childress exclaimed as I walked in. Welcome, brother. God told me you'd return, and here you are. Childers was standing over two white plastic camping tables, which held up Brother Robert's lifeless corpse, and it was quite evident that he was dead. He had that deathly pallor about him, that same grim jaundice I had seen so many others have in Vietnam. Behind him was the same man who had welcomed me into the tent the previous night, only this time he was carrying a shotgun. Pastor, we need to talk. Not now, brother. Plenty of time to talk when Brother Robert is back. Brother Robert isn't coming back, Pastor. You and I... Please, no more talking. Pastor Childers interrupted. All your doubts will be cleared soon enough. Now take your seats, brothers and sisters. The time of rebirth is upon us. Again, Tack was growling something fierce, but he kept it low, sticking close to my side as we were awaiting to what was to come. We got something special here, folks. Childers began. There's something in these hills that God put here long, long ago, and we must show our gratitude for it. A smattering of amens came back from the congregation before the pastor continued. So, will it be with the resurrection of the dead? He said, his voice rising with every sentence. The body that is sown is perishable, but it's raised imperishable. It's sown into dishonor, but it was raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. 
The congregation were calling back to him now, as he motioned to a man off stage. Bring me the serpent that took this boy's life. Pastor Childers bellowed, and at his command, the man picked up the same wicker basket that Brother Robert had carried just the night before. And it was the snake that killed him still alive and still deadly. Childers whipped open the lid, plunged his hand into the basket, and raised the snake up by its head. And as he held it up to the congregation, he produced a small knife and began to slice through the snake's throat. Once it had been decapitated, another member of the congregation appeared to be holding a large glass bowl, and the snake's blood was carefully and methodically drained into it before they continued. The pastor Childers placed the snake's remains on Brother Thomas's lifeless chest before taking a short step back. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, he bellowed, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We will not sleep. We will all be changed. The congregation began to whoop and holler, and in turn, Pastor Childers' intensity began to build. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. He was foaming at the mouth now, fire and brimstone in his words. Then and only then we will have the saying that will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. As Pastor Childers ranted and raved, my attention was suddenly drawn away from him. The headless snake that lay on Robert's chest it began to move. It was only slight at first, little twitches that could easily be mistaken as belated death rose, but soon it was unmistakable. The snake, the dead snake, was moving. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Childers screamed, motioning to the sheer impossibility before him. Where, O oh death, is your sting? And at that, the snake began to slither, stump first into Brother Robert's open mouth and down into his throat. I could not believe what I was seeing. Watching the headless, blood-soaked snake disappear down Brother Robert's throat was the single most horrifying thing I had ever witnessed. Nothing I had seen in Nam could possibly compare. But instead of running for their lives, the congregation were in raptures. Some were weeping, others spoke in tongues, the rest simply stood there, as in a deep trance swaying from side to side. Me, on the other hand, it was like I was dumbstruck. I was glued to that spot, just clamoring to comprehend what the hell I was seeing. Then, when I thought things couldn't get any more insane, Brother Robert woke up. Tack was just about losing his mind at this point, unleashing a flurry of high-pitched whines as he tugged at the sleeve of my jacket. He was begging me to leave, but I just couldn't. I remember putting a hand on my mouth in pure shock, watching as Brother Robert coughed, sputtered, and gasped for air. He looked terrified, his sunken eyes wide and fearful, and they darted around the room in confusion. The congregation spilled out of their seats toward him. People were weeping. Others cried out, Hallelujah! The joy they felt was otherworldly, and as Brother Robert embraced his loved ones after a long, deep sleep, he began to smile. All lies were on Robert. Not a single person wanted this moment to be missed, this miracle of a resurrection. All except one. The girl who had visited me at the motel. She was staring at me. The desperate look in her eyes that screamed for God's sake to do something. But I didn't have anything to do, because Robert did it for me. Give me some room, Pastor Childers cried out. Let me welcome our dear brother back into the land of the living. The congregation rescinded like waves from a beach allowing Childers to get face to face with the still smiling Robert. Only as I watched him approach, I noticed there was something horribly wrong about Robert's face. His eyes were wide open, almost like he didn't have any eyelids at all, and his smile was stretched so unnaturally wide that I swear you could see every single one of his teeth. It wasn't a happy smile. It was something else. Something terrifying. Robert, Childers asked. Robert, it's me, Pastor Childers. I want to... Childers was silenced by the lightning-fast movement of Robert's arms. In an instant, his hands were wrapped around the pastor's throat. He gasped for air as the congregation leapt to his defense, trying to pry Robert's hands off of his neck. But it was no good. For a man who had been clinically deceased just a few moments before, Robert was horrifyingly strong and we all heard the moment he crushed the pastor's larynx with a sickening crunch. Robert then swung the pastor around, knocking down several of the congregation. 
as he flung the man's limp body in the direction. Robert, no, what in the God's name are you doing? Yet it was as if he could not hear them. He simply grabbed another member of the congregation and sunk his teeth into her face. The scream she let out was gut-wrenching, punctuated by the sound of a shotgun shell racking into the chamber. Get the hell off of her, Robert. The armed man roared, aiming the barrel squarely at his head. Robert let go, spitting out the chewed remains of her nose on the earthen floor of the tent, and with that same sick smile splitting his face into two, he slowly turned back towards the armed man. Please, Robert, he said. Please snap out of it. Robert responded by taking a few slow steps toward him, before suddenly and violently lunging. Buckshot tore through the right side of Robert's skull, popping it open like a smashed watermelon. The boy stood there for a moment, staggering to and fro, and then it looked like he was about to drop. Then out of nowhere, Robert once again lunged towards the man, grabbing hold of the shotgun and using it as leverage to smash what remained of his forehead into the man's mouth. He fell back, letting go of the shotgun, blood pouring from his pulverized lips. Robert had racked around into the shotgun, a percussive hit to the melody of the downed man's pleas for his life. Some of his teeth fell out of his mouth as he begged. Robert aimed the shotgun square at the man's hands, clasped together in a prayer, and fired. The man howled as everything above the wrist simply disintegrated, all while the congregation begged Robert to come to his senses. Instead, he racked another round into the chamber, aimed the shotgun at the wounded man's head, and fired. The sound of his scream degenerating into a gurgle still haunts my nightmares. And that was the moment I came to my own senses and got the hell out of that revival tent. Run, boy, run, I screamed. But Tack did not need to be told. He bolted on ahead as the sounds of the unfolding massacre echoed through the trees behind us. And here's where I bring up my wounded leg. Remember the one I told you about 12 pages back? It means I can't run very far or very fast. And we ended up paying for it. Because at one point I looked back to see something catching up to us. I think it's another survivor from the tent, but when I turn, all I see is Brother Robert, hurling towards me, shotgun in hand. He pumps one final round into the chamber, raises the shotgun, and then something else tears past me in the darkness. It was Tack barreling towards the thing that used to be Brother Robert, and, with his good eye, it tracked Tack as he leapt towards him and took its last shot. The next thing I see is Brother Robert in the dirt and Tack has him by the throat, whipping his neck back and forth, chewing and piercing, drowning Robert in his own blood. At first, I didn't think that'd finish him off, but when Tack climbed off of him and Robert ceased to move, I breathed a deep sigh of relief, but it was one taken far too soon. No sooner than I had said good boy, Tack collapsed to the ground. The thing that used to be Robert had indeed landed his final shot, filling Tack's gut full of buckshot in the seconds before he delivered the killer blow. I went into autopilot, picked Tack up and ran as fast as I could back to the car, driving like a man possessed, not even sure where I was headed. I just remember looking over at him at one point to see if he was still alive, if he was still with me, and he was gone. His big brown eyes stared off into oblivion. I pulled the car over to the side of the highway and burst into tears. I never loved anything in my whole life like I loved that dog. After we got back from Nam and the things had gotten bad for a while, he was the only thing that kept me from eating my gun. Every single time I thought about ending it, I think who's going to feed Tack? And that was that. All the guys whose lives he had saved, they'd kick my ass if they knew I'd ever dared to mistreat him. He was my best friend in the world and now he was gone. I tried and failed to save his life just like he had saved mine that day in the jungle. And just like he did that day in Three Forks. And that's just something I must live with. I couldn't bring myself to write up the story. I just apologized to my editor and told him I had to pass on it. After all, who in their right minds would believe me? When he asked about what happened in Kentucky, I just told him it was a hunting accident. A few years later, I took a job down in Florida, working as the sports correspondent for the Gainesville Sun, and I ended up retiring here too. I mean, to go back to Three Forks one day, to really address what happened, just not yet, not yet. I have a new dog these days, also ex-military, and he's also a German Shepherd. I think he takes more care of me than I take care of him at this point, and he certainly makes for a better company than my ex-wife. As for a name, I call him Junior, and I don't think I have to tell you who that's after. Uh, 
I used to go to the mountains every year. Multiple times if fate would allow it. There's something so peaceful about feeling isolated from the rest of the world. I don't have to look down at my phone and worry about bills or keeping up with my friends. For a brief window of time, it's just me and what the world has created. Every year, I would visit the town of Estes and stay overnight so I could grab an early start and avoid as many people as possible. It had gotten to the point where I was recognized and formed friendships with some of the locals. Most anyone working at the diners, where I got some fuel before heading up the mountain, probably knew who I was. My car and I would traverse the Trail Ridge Road. Stopping on the viewpoints along the road, I would observe the wildlife. Rolling green would lay out in front of me, dotted with the remnants of snowfall. I would make sure to stop at every given opportunity and take a few good breaths to slowly acclimate myself to the higher altitude and lower intake of oxygen. That's what I used to do anyways. I haven't been back there in a few years now. I think it was three years ago now that it happened. It's hard to keep track anymore. I try not to think about it too much. I've had issues with the memories popping back up without much cause and sending me into a fit. My chest gets all tight and it's hard to breathe. I swear, whenever it happens, I can hear its footsteps, but I'm getting ahead of myself. My therapist that I started seeing following the event told me it might be a good idea to get it out, write it on paper, or tell people my story. So that's what this is. I have no idea if something like this will help, but at this point I'll try anything. I'd love to finish telling my story and be able to get an uninterrupted night's sleep. So, three years ago, like I said, if I ever got the opportunity, I would go back multiple times in a year, and as fate had it, that was such a year. I had a decent chunk of vacation time saved up at work, so I decided to take an extra holiday for myself. Everything went about as you'd expect. It was warmer than normal, as I try to go in the quarter months usually, I got into town the same as always. I booked nearly the same room in the same hotel as the last time I visited and threw my stuff into the hotel room. Before heading to bed, I made sure to plot out my intended traveling so I could show someone where I was planning to go. I had been there so many times, and as beautiful as everything was, I liked to try and go off the beaten path when I could. In the event something happened to me, I wanted people to know where I was. That's exactly what I did the next morning. I was greeted by the workers at the local diner and made sure to show them the map, telling them when I expected to return. With enough fuel to get me through most of the day, I headed out. The first place I wanted to go was a decent drive up Trail Ridge Road, Lulu City, a place I was surprised that I'd never gotten around to visiting. Pulling onto the side of the road, I sat at the shoulder looking at the elevation between me and the town. A town that had diminished into a small portion of the horizon. Turning the car off and locking it, I was pleasantly surprised to find myself alone on the trail. The fewer people that were around me, the more connected to the environment I could feel. It's like when you watch a movie in the theater. You're so much more immersed when it's quiet. Just a few chattering conversations can taint the entire experience. They say with hindsight, it's much easier to see the red flags. When I think back though, it's hard for me to tell where my first sign to turn back really was. You'll hear a lot of sounds walking through the forest, and sounds travel pretty far. So it's hard to say what's unusual and what isn't. Even if you've heard something hundreds of times, it can sound alien. I remember as I was walking the trail, I heard what sounded like several booms from a distant thunder. The noise happened in rapid succession, like the beating of drums, though the weather hadn't called for such noises. At the time, I thought it could have just been the snapping of a nearby tree and the resulting noise of it was smacking into the ground. I ignored it and continued on my path, feeling the mountain air fill my lungs surrounded by trees, all by myself. There was the occasional skittering of wildlife. I even came across a large print in the middle of the trail. 
I assumed it to be a bear as black bears have been spotted near the trail. It's a nearly four mile hike, which isn't all that bad as the elevation didn't climb too much. Around two hours after I had initially set out, I found myself looking at the old sign for Lulu City, an old mining town that had been abandoned in the 1800s. I walked slowly through the place. There were old cabins around the area and various plots of land that once served as foundations for more homes. It was incredible to sit in a ghost town, nestled near the Rocky Mountains. It was almost as if the place had pushed them out. From the little research I had done, it seemed like the profit margin for the silver they were mining just wasn't enough to justify the town. Though, knowing what I know now, I can't help but wonder if something else was at play all those years ago. I looked around for a while at the large open area where the town used to sit. There were around 40 cabins at the town's prime. All that remained were the remnants of three, a few building sites, and a sign for the town. Citing the population was at 200 people. I sat down for a moment, leaning my back against the tree, looking at the area surrounding me, pouring some water down my throat. I watched the tree line. There was this creeping sensation you get when someone is staring at the back of your head. I felt that, but it was like I knew where the feeling was coming from, but I couldn't quite see it. As I was focused on an area of trees where the paranoia was stemming from, I noticed a shadow moving. I had thought at first it was just a dark area where the sun had difficulty getting through. As the shadow shifted, however, it was revealed there was just a dark mass blocking my view. My initial reaction was to just assume the figure was a black bear or an elk, but it was hard to convince myself of that as the shadow reached far too high off the ground. Either way, I just sat and watched. I wasn't about to call any attention to myself, especially if my initial reaction was correct. I had bear mace and the likes, but if I could avoid using it, I would rather do that. With the shadow retreating into the woods, I stood slowly from my spot and decided to exit Lulu. As I turned around, I heard a familiar cracking of trees. This time, however, the sound continued for a good minute or two. It was as if the drums of war had been rung and a warning was shooting through the mountain. I wondered if anyone on the other trails were able to hear the noise as it was so loud that it made me cover my own ears. As I started retreating from the noise, it stopped and... As I reached the exit to Lulu City, I saw a shadow once more. This time, it was much closer to me. I was able to make out more about it. Part of its dark structure being the antlers atop its head. They weren't the same, jagged and pointy antlers that decorated the indigenous elk around Rocky Mountain. They were more solid, resembling that of a moose's. They were much larger than any pair I'd seen before, though large enough to shovel the snow out of the driveway in one go. I backed up a bit, hearing the foliage bending and cracking under my footsteps. I honestly did not know how to approach the situation, because I did not know what I was looking at. The thing was still shaded by the trees and I couldn't make out its body structure other than it being massive. I wonder how something of that size was able to move so quickly through the trees. Then I caught a glimpse of the eyes it was using to watch me. It was only when shreds of light reflected off of them. The first two shimmering orbs appeared from under its antlers, and then to my shock, another set of lights, fainter than the ones of above them appeared. It was uncanny. Looking at something with such a familiar shape, yet I couldn't decipher what the thing was, or what it wanted from me. I didn't want to keep staring, in case it took direct eye contact as a threat. Averting my gaze, I listened to the creature stumbling around before the commotion caused by their movements dissipated into the foreground. With the noise of that thing distant, I turned back and saw no sight of the thing. I decided it was best to leave the area quickly and quietly. I thought the thing might consider Lulu City its territory and was giving me a stern warning. I started walking back ready for the easy hike. Watching the dirt path at my feet, I came across a fresh footprint. It was massive. Putting my foot into it revealed that my foot didn't even make up half the size of one of its toes. 
The thing was massive and heavy. I didn't want to call my trip short, so as I walked the trail back to my car, I thought of just going to the next spot ahead of schedule. I always try to end my visits by looking out over Bear Lake. It's just so pristine, it's hard to ignore. I kept my eyes on the trees the whole time, making sure that some hulking shadow wasn't lurking. Before I knew it, I was exiting the trail and climbing into my car, with a hum, and the vehicle sprang back to life. It wasn't too long before I had gotten to as far as my car would take me before I had to stop and walk the rest of the way. Surprisingly, once again I found myself alone. There were a few other cars where I parked, but once I got to the lake, I didn't see anyone else on the trails. It felt like everyone had been scared off. Bear Lake is normally a pretty popular spot for people visiting. I had the feeling like I was missing something, like everyone else got a memo that I didn't. I sat for a while on a large boulder by the side of the lake, watching the winds ripple small patterns over the smooth surface of the water. It wasn't often you could go there and not hear the howling of screaming children and their parents, so I intended to soak as much of it in as I could. As I sat there, I could see the line of trees on the other side of the lake. The tops of them created an ocean of green that only surrendered to the peaks behind them. I watched that ocean of green sway like a hurricane was sweeping through them. The treetops moved and buckled as I heard familiar smacking noises begin to get louder. The realization dawning on me that whatever I had seen before wasn't warning me. It had been following me and continued to do so as I left the site. I had driven there though. I thought it would be impossible for that thing to be able to have made it here so quickly. With the shifting of the treetops getting closer, I slowly rose to my feet when I saw something eject from the top of the trees. It hung in the air for a moment before crashing down into the lake before me. It was brief, but I saw the object enough to know that the thing had flung a rock l rather large, probably bigger than my body, like it was nothing. I started stepping backward when my ankle rolled on a rock and I fell backward crashing to the ground. My elbow made contact with the hard surface pulling apart the fabric of my sweater and slicing through my skin. Quickly, I opened the small first aid kit I had brought with me, hearing the thunderous noise getting closer. I poured my drinking water onto the wound and wrapped it with a bandage. As I finished tending to the small wound, I noticed that the noise had halted. Slowly ignoring the pain in my ankle and the stinging on my elbow, I looked over the rock to see. The trees were no longer swaying, only moving with a gentle push of the wind. That's when I heard a noise to my right. A huff. Turning slowly, avoiding sudden movements, I saw the beast that had been watching me. I saw it bathed in the sun. Every detail. This thing was some twisted amalgamation. It dwarfed me in size. I could have been twice as tall and still not met it eye to eye. I did not know what I was supposed to do if I was supposed to run or stay still. I watched its pitch black fur ruffle as it took a step towards me, offering another huff out of the bear-shaped nose. Its whole head reminded me of a bear, except for the angular structure around its eyes that looked more like a buck. Four stern and focused eyes, all of varying shades of amber, peered toward me. Its body, again was reminiscent of a bear that had a bizarre length to it, almost like its belly was dragging against the dirt. If it wasn't for the massive paws pushing down into the ground, the thing would topple over. It moved its head back and forth, shaking its whole body. Small clicking groans emitted from the open jaw, a jawline with thick and sharp teeth. My reasoning was starting to go out the window, and the urge to just run and get the heck out of there was mounting by the moment. I was backing away and had noticed I was making it back to the trail, but the creature matched my movements. We were both surrounded by trees and the thing started moving its head side to side, smacking its large antlers onto the nearby trees. As it did, the tree's bark ripped free, exposing lighter tones. As close as I was, the smashing of the massive antlers against the trees was like a shotgun going off next to your ear. It caused me to hold my hands over my ears as I tried to back away. I wanted to run, but the moment I put too much pressure on my ankle, I knew I would buckle, so all I could do was continue to back away hopping. 
and just hoped that it wouldn't charge. It just kept walking forward, smacking one tree after another like it was trying to intimidate me. I watched amazed as if its large frame bulldozed through the trees like it was nothing. I don't know what I did to upset it more than I already had, but the clicking noise from its mouth picked up and it charged at me. The ground was trembling under the thing's footsteps and before I had time to process what was happening, an antler made contact with me. The memories get all foggy from there. I remember being shunted to the side, my legs colliding with a tree, and I spun out into the bush. Nearly unconscious, I laid surrounded by dirt and leaves as the bear-like creature approached me. It smelled me, interested particularly in the blood spilling out of my legs where the bones had broken on impact. I got a good look at its eyes before I passed out. One was a set of eyes that you'd expect to see on a mammal, while the others were more lizard-like. Those eyes were the last thing I saw before passing out. It was a miracle I ever made it out of there. Some other visitors had heard the commotion and headed over to find me passed out. They stopped my bleeding and got me to the hospital in Estes. I wish I could go hiking still. I'm not afraid of running into that thing again, but my legs were beyond repair, and I haven't been able to walk ever since. I still think about that creature. I did as much research as I could, but never found anything that looked like that thing. Some monstrous combination of a bear and elk. I wondered if that was the real reason Lulu City was abandoned. Maybe. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't think I'll ever know. Sometimes, I hear the clicking noises it made. Every thunderstorm I hear makes me think about the creature bashing its head into the trees. Maybe it did that as a show of strength, like when bucks smack their antlers together. I don't want to believe that's true though, because I couldn't imagine what a behemoth like that needs to prove its strength to. What other secrets could the Rocky Mountains contain? Are there more of those things there? or perhaps another manner of beast. Every night I go to sleep, I look out my window. I think of those four eyes peering at me through the dark, waiting to finish what they started. I'm not sure if I'll ever feel better having written this all out. Reading it as I go, I almost don't believe it myself. Maybe I'll feel better if I just convince myself nothing ever happened. That I just fell and tumbled hard enough to crack the bones in my legs like twigs. Maybe then, I'll be able to get some sleep. Sixteen hundred. That is the estimated number of individuals that go missing while inside state and national parks every year. It is a rough estimate, of course. The government has not and does not want to track numbers like this. So the number could be higher, could be lower, but even with a generous benefit of the doubt applied, every year an alarming amount of people walk into the woods or a forest and are never seen again. Sometimes these cases are fairly cut and dry, with enough context clues and physical evidence to assume the individual simply got lost. In all likelihood, either a lack of knowledge or a moment of panic caused them to fall and become injured or they just got turned around. The trees can mess with you, have you thinking that you are walking in a straight line only to find yourself double back on your own footprints. There are times, however, where context clues do not point to anything sensible, instead resembling a tattered ball of yarn. When physical evidence only serves to raise more questions than it answers, times when a child goes missing and a whole host of people are called in to search. They look and they look some more, but there is not a single hint of three-year-old Timmy who is still struggling on how to tie his shoes. Mothers and fathers weep, sobbing hot tears as they are told they cannot find a trace of their child. How? How can there be nothing? The parents plead. Kids are sloppy and chaotic. Surely there must be some shred of evidence. But there's not. It is like Timmy was plucked from reality. This does not happen too often, but it is often enough to make you scratch your head. Often enough 
to send you into a rabbit hole of conspiracy and theories. The government is using people as test subjects. Aliens are taking them. Bigfoot just wants a friend. You can get so lost trying to see the forest for the trees that it all blends into one hazy lump of paranoia and speculation. I grew up in the woods. Not like by wolves or anything, but my father had a cabin, and I would spend more time there than I did in the city. The woods are a strange and intimidating place. The woods are not concerned whether you make it out of them. The trees do not shed a tear for the lost souls within them. I learned so much growing up that when I got older, I got a job doing anything I could in the forest. Park ranger, tour guide, and anything else in between. And then, the number crept into our forest. An estimated 1,600 go missing every year, and within the span of just two weeks, the forest I worked at contributed seven souls to that tally. Three of those, seven, were found without much incident. Only two were alive when found, unfortunately. But still, a missing report is a missing report. It is the other four that sent everyone into a tizzy. Somehow, it was more acceptable that one of the seven had died than it was that the other four had left virtually no trace. Andrew Wells, 16, was hiking with his mother. They had not gone but a quarter of a mile into the forest before Andrew's mother turned around to find she was walking alone. The forest is not very dense until you find yourself deeper in. The mother said she started screaming his name, and soon enough, everyone with an earshot was too. They never got any reply. The mother swore up and down. She could still hear Andrew's footsteps up until the point she turned around. She said something about him having a heavy step. Those steps were not there though. We could see the mother's footprints and even the beginning of Andrew's, but at some point, around halfway, they just abruptly stopped. It was the oddest thing though. Right where his footsteps had ended, where his next step would have been, laid a small, fractured bone. Not a human bone or anything, but like a small animal's bone that had been picked clean. Heather, Harlan, Seven. She and her brother were being treated to a small picnic by their parents, Samantha and Colin. They were in a small enough clearing of trees that they could all comfortably sit down. Heather and her brother began playing Duck Duck Goose, running around their parents as fast as they could as their food were being set up. They listened to Heather calling out as her feet kicked around the foliage. Duck, 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 duck. The parents said it was like someone snapping you back into reality after you have started daydreaming. That sinking realization that you do not know what is going on. Heather's voice was gone. Her footsteps had stopped. Her brother poor kid was shouting that she was on the other side of the tree. That she was still there. The only thing we found of Heather's, on the other side of that path, was her shoe. I say we found it, but what I mean is that a search dog found it. It put its nose right up to the dirt and huffed. The dog was permitted to dig and sure enough, a small pink shoe appeared, about a foot down. I was there watching the dog because it was my dog, Ellie. As I threw Ellie a bone for finding something, it unsettled me that Ellie waited for permission to dig. I had trained her since she was a puppy. She knew not to dig unless the ground had already been dug up. Joshua McMillan, 42. There is not much to say or even much sense to this one. Joshua told his wife he was going on a short hike. People knew he hiked there nearly every day. I knew Joshua well. He was experienced. I would even go as far to say he knew more about the forest than I did. I guess that is why it shocked me when his family reported him missing. His belongings were found by a river. All of them had been carefully set down, and a picture of him and his wife rested on top. Yes, Immediately, the unfortunate assumption of suicide was brought up among the search party. Then I hesitate to wonder how he would have done it. If he planned to use the river, he would have had to walk quite a way for it to get deep enough to put his head under. There were no footprints, but he could have made his way through the river, I guess. It is the phone calls that set me on edge. He called his wife three times, 
and they are as follows. Call one. Hey darling, just letting you know I got here, and I'm a little way in. Trying to find somewhere to rest for a minute. That river you like sure sounds nice. Call two. I must be getting old. It feels like I've been walking for hours already, but I can hear the river coming up. Anyways, I hope to catch you next time I call. Love you. Call three. I can't find the river. I've been walking. The sound never gets louder. Why won't you? To me. Oh God, why won't the river? Can you? The river? I am terribly... The reason his wife never picked up, however, is because all three calls came within a span of four minutes. The first of those calls came in just an hour after he left the house, which is about when he should have started his hike. Then there is the most recent one, the one I took to the most, the one that humbled me in what I thought I might know about the forest and the things within it. Nathaniel Carter, 13, was with his friends and their dad. Nathaniel said he needed to use the bathroom so he ran behind a thick enough tree so he could not be seen to relieve himself. The father of his friends kept an eye on the tree, just to make sure Nathaniel did not bolt off or that some stranger did not come along. They were not deep enough into the woods to confidently say that no one else was around. He said he watched that tree for a good three minutes before calling out to Nathaniel. When he did, Nathaniel responded by screaming. So, the father stood up and ran over. When reaching the other side of the tree, as I'm sure you had guessed, Nathaniel was nowhere to be seen. A few things stuck out though. The area where Nathaniel had been standing was in rough shape. The dirt was kicked up and looked as though someone had been frantically digging at it. Where the ground had been dug was completely clear of foliage. It looked as though someone had intentionally created a clear circle. In the middle of that circle was Nathaniel's shirt. A brand new shirt that looked like it had seen years of wear and tear. The tree was the oddest. The bark on the side Nathaniel was standing on was stripped. The tree was bare from the bottom to about the height of a child. And again, the area was clear of foliage and debris. We were unsure if the tree had always been like that or not, but I had a gut feeling that it had not been. With all these cases, it felt like a gut feeling was all we had to go on, and none of us felt good about any of them. For the first three cases, the mentioned searches were done and nothing was discovered. No bodies or remnants of the existence of any of these people. And while Nathaniel's case was much the same, I found myself compelled to investigate it on my own. I was still tending to my duties, but whenever I could sneak away, I would find myself back at that tree, staring at the barren bark trying to wrap my head around what could have occurred. I played movies in my head. Movies about a man quickly running by and picking up the 13 year old. Movies about extra dimensional beings pulling the kid into their realm. Then it came time for my weekend off. I pulled myself out of bed and stared at my calendar. Thick red X's marked off the days that had since passed. I pulled the marker up and sliced through the 24th and stared at the small red dot left on the side of my hand by the marker. Then, without another thought, I whistled for Ellie. We were on our way to that tree. Watching Ellie sniff the ground around the tree, I carefully kicked some of the foliage on the ground aside. Despite having done it a thousand times already, I still maintained hope that I would see something I had not before. There was a stiff breeze that rushed through the trees, whistling against the bark as it brushed by me. Staring at the ground, I noticed the breeze pushing the foliage around, but none of it landed in the circle. Feeling a tinge of curiosity, I lifted my focus to where the wind originated from and through the spaces in the trees, I saw a figure. A human standing perfectly framed by the trees as if they had wanted me to see them, like they had used the wind to call for me. The figure stood far enough away from me that I could not make out any features despite the sun that penetrated the trees above me. Piercing, God rays meticulously avoiding the person. The leash in my hand grew taut as Ellie stepped cautiously in the direction of the figure. I swear I had my eye right on the person when my vision blurred. I had not blinked and my eye was starting to dry out. I quickly rubbed it and tried to lubricate it with a tear that rested on the corner of my eyelid. Of course, once I was done, the phantom was gone, but Ellie still looked to where the individual was. I could see her nostrils flaring. She had the scent. 
Placing my hand on her collar, I clicked down on the metal clasp holding the leash and collar together. Ellie is a good girl, trained well, and I can trust her more than I can trust most people. With her free from the leash, I told her to follow the smell. Her paws trounced through the forest floor as I followed closely behind. She snaked through the trees, lowering her nose to the ground following the scent. She rounded one of the trees as I followed her. I came to find that she had vanished. I stopped dead in my tracks, feeling how still the air had gotten all of a sudden. A gut feeling more pungent and aggressive than the others rose slowly through my gut. It was like acid bubbling. I swiveled my head all around looking for Ellie. I whistled in hopes to hear her respond. Yet, silence filled the air, hoping to hear any movements from her. I did not move too much or panic, but it was hard to ignore the tingling. It was coating my skin. It was the first time I had felt it, but something instinctual in me knew what it was. The feeling of being prey, watched by a predator. Quickly, I stepped around the trees looking for my dog, suddenly feeling more isolated than I ever had before. As I started to feel the panic seize me, the lease in my hand had suddenly become taut once more. With a cursory glance, Ellie was sitting at the other end of it. Her nose pointed forward, and I could see she was looking at something. That very same figure, closer, but still unrecognizable. My nostrils flared this time as huffs of anxiety plumed out. My jaw was clenched shut. I pulled at Ellie's leash with the figure closer now. I could at the very least tell it was not a child. The thing was broader and taller than I was. Ellie was reluctant at first, but with a harder pull, she gave in and followed me. I turned away from the figure and started heading in the other direction, wondering if I was letting my nerves get the best of me. That maybe I had been focusing too much on these cases. What primordial intelligence had been hiding in my brain that so desperately urged me to not interact with the figure? The same intelligence that conducted my body into running away from it, not just walking or jogging. Me and Ellie were shuffling through the trees. This time I kept her close by my side, making sure not to break eyesight. I was nearly thrown to the ground when Ellie abruptly stopped and yanked my arm behind me. She had her nose to the ground again before I could usher her to move once more. She started digging at the dirt. As she continued to dig, I could see through the clumps of dirt a small fleck of pink that got bigger and bigger. A shoe. A little girl's pink shoe. Ellie whined at the discovery, and I pulled at her leash once again. When she had dug the dirt up, there were no debris. A perfect circle of dirt laid around the site down on the side. I wanted to throw up, and I'm not sure if I was even afraid anymore. I felt like I had been staring at an unfinished puzzle for hours, and when I finally found the pieces that fit, the picture that resulted did not make any sense. I was not understanding something bigger than me, and it was making me physically ill. Even though I had made my way to the tree a dozen times, I could not remember how to get back anymore. I had become so disoriented. I did not know how it could be possible that I would end up at the tree again. Looking around, trying to get a bearing on my surroundings, I saw the figure in the distance once more. The figure was walking this time, its hand holding something to its ear, and as if it carried by the window, I heard echoes of a voice. The gut, feeling that had been rising all at once plummeted when the tendril-ridden word pried into my ears. An older man's voice, shaking and exhausted, desperately crying up. Oh God, why won't the river show up? The words clattered. The figure in the distance sputtered for a moment before turning its attention to me. Can you find the river? I'm terribly lost. My body started to go limp as I started trotting backward. Trying to keep myself steadied, I rested my hand against the nearest tree when I felt something slam into my side. As my body fell to the floor, I heard the voice echo. This voice was much smaller and childlike. It exclaimed, Goose! Before I could get up and rise to my feet, the footsteps hurried away from me. I did not feel like I could get up. My heart was tapping against my ribcage. The once calming and scenic view of the tree stretching far above me now looked like ancient fingers trying to grasp me. Ellie laid next to me, placing her head on my thigh, staring at me. She was used to getting treats when she found something. 
I reached into my pocket and pulled out a bone and handed it to her. And as always, she very clumsily tried to devour it. Half of it dropped out of her mouth when she clamped down her jaw. The bone hit the floor and it rested for a moment. I could see it starting to sink into the earth as if it were being pushed down. The white bone started to crack and splinter under the invisible weight. It was not long before I knew what I was looking at. This, of course, like everything else, filled me with dread, but also a sense of direction. Sitting up, I tried to remember the first time I saw that bone, what direction the footsteps could have been going in. Not even a quarter mile, half a quarter mile. That is how far I must have been getting out of the forest. Pulling myself to my feet, I inched forward, trying to break past the paralyzing uncertainty that had cocooned me. Trees passed by as I moved faster and faster. Ellie, following closely behind, the tree's density started to lessen and the area became more familiar. And before I knew it, I was collapsing into my car. It took me a while to drive back home, to shake what I had been trying to comprehend, trying to rationalize explanations for it. The forest, however, rarely offers explanations. There is a bewildering number of things we do not know about the planet we live on, whether it be the forest we hike through or the oceans we swim in. There is so much out there beyond us. The tree line is where we lose grip on footholds. We use to convince ourselves we know how things are supposed to work. I do not know what happened in that forest. I do not know what will happen when I come forward with my experience. All I know for certain, as I looked down at my calendar and I lifted the red marker, drawn an X over the 24th to mark it off, is that in some cases, we are not meant to see the forest for the trees. When I was younger, I have very vivid memories of when my family and I would go camping. It was my favorite thing to do, and we always tried to go at least twice a year, whenever warmer weather would allow it. For a long time, it was that way. Always the same campsite too. There was a post by the campsite that we used to mark how tall I was each time we went. Thin, dark lines showing the passage of time. Then, we just stopped going. I would ask my dad why we didn't go anymore and he would offer vague excuses. With a wave of a hand, he would tell me he was just too busy and was never willing to go further into the discussion. It was not until I was a bit older when I figured out what might have been the real reason. As a kid, memories of our final camping trip were not all that odd since I just didn't understand what happened. But with enough time, hindsight had made it clear why my father did not want to go back. I remember wandering off the campsite. I didn't walk all that far away, and I could swear it had only been a few minutes. And then I heard my dad scream for me. Not a scream you'd expect to hear when first calling out for someone. It was a ragged and desperate cry, like the shaking howl of someone pleading for something that they had already convinced themselves was not going to happen. I went towards his voice and he saw me. He dropped to his knees. It was almost like he didn't believe I was real. Tears were caking blotches of dirt that stuck on his face. He gave me one of those never letting you go hugs. I was so confused. It had only been a minute or two, but he looked so out of sorts. There were other people too. They all crowded around us, relief washing over their faces. For a while, my dad did not take his eyes off me. For me, it was a few minutes, but for him, it must have been different longer. Even with the hindsight, I couldn't make sense of it, but I knew my dad was too afraid of it happening again, so we just stopped going, but unfortunately for my father, the memories had the opposite effect on me. I became obsessed with trying to find out what happened to me that day. It was a yearning that never went away. As I got older, I got better and analyzed the data and sifted through various cases I could find online. I studied forest maps and tried to track trajectories and try to put myself in the missing person's shoes. I even started to study in fields I thought would be relevant throughout college, stuff like psychology, biology, and anything I could find relating to the forest and landscapes. 
This continued well into my 20s. When I was around 27, I had come across a missing persons flyer in my town. A kid had gone missing in the same park I vanished in, a park I knew like the back of my hand. I joined the search party for the boy as his mother showed us where he vanished. After trekking through the forest trying my best to imagine a child, frightened and desperately searching for his mother, I came across the boy. He was sitting on a lone rock near a stream, probably going to the only noise he could hear. When I saw the mother's face it reminded me of my father and I was hooked. I had been unsure what career path I wanted to take, but I knew at that moment where my life was going. So I took the money I had saved up and started up my small business, a private contractor of sorts. A smile crept across my aging father's face when I told him what I was doing. My dad passed away when I was 32, but I'd like to believe I managed to make him happy before he left. I would tell him any time I managed to find someone, when I was able to reconnect loved ones and make their families whole again. I told him a lot of the stories sitting at his bedside. That's where he told me, in his final moments, just how long I had been gone as a child. Three days. Even if I remember time incorrectly, there is no way I would not have remembered three days passing. He knew that as well as I did. I did not have to tell him that I only remember being gone a few minutes. I'm sure he put those pieces together himself when he saw my clothing didn't have a bit of dirt on them. When I wasn't hungry after he found me and all that, and I wasn't scared, nobody understood. I wasn't injured, anything. He must have known something beyond his understanding happened, but he was a logical guy, so he would have just refused to talk or even think about it. Before my father's passing, I was just helping recently missing people get found. Though, some questioned my ethics. People criticized me for not needing a 24-hour window to start looking for people. For making people pay me for my services and circumventing law enforcement. Though, to my credit, with that first point, if I found somebody, it was clear they didn't want to be found. I would return the client's deposit and let officials handle the case. Was what I was doing illegal? I don't know, maybe. After my father's death, though, I started looking into more abstract missing cases, more commonly referred to online as Missing 411. Honestly, a lot of them could just be explained by inexperienced people not knowing what to do or where to go. The more interesting cases, however, were the ones in which seasoned explorers and the likes went missing without a trace, or when the traces they left didn't seem to add up. Stuff like shoes hanging in trees or clothing found miles away from where they went missing, though it's possible animals could have produced the latter. As I continue to handle clients, people go missing far more often than you would expect. I was reading more and more about these strange missing 411 cases. Kids going missing as they pass by trees or adults seeming to just vanish in parking lots. I read through forums people depositing theories and trying to rationally explain it. All types of stuff. Bigfoot, aliens, or just mistaken directions were thrown around. It was a deep and bountiful rabbit hole. As I dove down it, I was surprised to come across a recent case that was not far from me. Ellie Wallings, 14, had gone missing in a state park. All that was found to indicate where he might have gone were some markings in the trees. Someone had carved arrows in the tree almost like Ellie was trying to remember which way he had gone. The arrows, however, appeared all over the forest. They will continue for a few trees before stopping and seemingly continue elsewhere. The only problem is, is these arrows are located sometimes miles apart in this large state park. While the park wasn't where I went missing, it was still a place I knew very well. I'd even volunteered to be a ranger to earn credits while in college. The arrows were not there when I was working the place or any time after I had visited. Before I had even finished reading the article, my mind was already made up. I grabbed a map of the park and tried to mark the locations where people had found the markings. There seemed to be no real pattern or predictability to them. There was no way to even know when the clusters of arrows were made. Which bunch was made after the other would be hard to discern but possibly I would be able to look at the growth around the trees, though that was a long shot. After finishing up what I needed for work, 
I started heading to the national park that was only a few hours away. It crossed my mind that there was a very real possibility that the arrows did not relate to Ellie's status at all. Maybe they were caused by something completely independent of that. Something like geocaching, or people trying to remember their campsites. The drive was over before I knew it, and I climbed out of the car, popped the trunk, and retrieved all of my equipment. Most of it was just to make sure I didn't get lost myself, and that if there was something that caused long-range traversal, that I would be able to locate where I had been moved to. One footstep after another led me into the forest as the sun pressed amber rays through the trees. I made sure to head in later than most people would, so to make my efforts a little bit more untainted. Before cell phone signals got too choppy to rely on, I made sure to send a text out to a loved one to let them know where I was and what I was doing. Then the parking lot was lost behind me as I continued deeper into the forest. With map in hand, I traced my steps and made note of any notable sights. On the off chance, I ran into them again and accidentally doubled back. The closest and presumably first set of carved arrows were not necessarily too far into the woods. Only ten minutes or so had gone by, and I was already laying my eyes on the scratched bark. Following the first arrow, I quickly came upon another, and then another. There were six arrows seemingly evenly spaced before they stopped appearing. The last arrow was also pointed downward at an angle, almost like it was pointing to the small clearing before me, rather than the forest ahead. I initially ignored this and began walking through the small open space, trying to figure out and follow the path of the arrows. Though the clusters of arrows didn't line up on paper, I figured I could see if the twisting paths trees take you on would eventually lead me to the next cluster. Still, there was a crawling sensation that ran across my body as I stepped into the clearing, like my intuition was screaming at me. I slowly walked around the circle. After just a few minutes of going around, I noticed a very slight angling of my foot. The angle would change as I walked around. The more I looked at the ground, the more I could see that the fallen leaves and brush seemed to be cluttered in the middle as if the ground was like a cone. Feeling a faint sense of danger, I reached into my backpack to grab some sort of rope in there, and as I walked to a nearby tree, I felt my body drop. Without warning, I fell through the earth and my ankles nearly twisted as I made impact with the surface below. Stumbling, my body crashed to the floor where I laid, trying to take in my surroundings, dazed and confused. Fingers scanned the area. All of it seemed to just be tightly compacted dirt. Scattered stones would flick against my fingernails here and there. The place I had fallen into was dark, the only light coming from the light above my head from where I had fallen. With my rope in hand, I was already thinking about how I would climb back out, as I figured my mystery had just been solved. Reaching into my backpack that had thankfully made the trip with me, I pulled out a weighty chrome cylinder and with a click a beam of light shot out. The beam fell over the surrounding area, and for the most part, I was correct. The walls were concave, which meant I wouldn't be able to climb out of them. Though, what I didn't expect were to see long thin columns of white that ran up the wall. The columns had bulges that were placed at least a foot from each other. It didn't take much more than a cursory glance to recognize them. These were bones. Whether they were from humans or animals, I don't know. They varied in size and seemed to have been picked clean. Some of the bones were starting to decay, but others were in pristine white condition. They looked museum ready. I think in that moment, my mind was still trying to take everything in. I was lucky that my ankles didn't just shatter, but they were still burning. Pointing the flashlight up, I could see just how far I was from the hole that I had fallen into. As my flashlight was pointed up, a figure from the side came into frame. Did you know that it isn't a fight or flight response? It's supposed to be fight, flight, or freeze, with freeze being the most common way for the body to react to unexpected stress. The body slows down so it can assess the threats and think before acting. The thing walked into my flashlight's beam revealing the details of its small and dainty frame. It was like the size and shape of a toddler but its arms and legs were longer than you've ever seen on a child. The flashlight's beams made it kind of apparent that its pale skin was translucent, as I could see the veins running underneath its skin. 
The creature effortlessly climbed the walls, thinning fingers piercing the dirt, supporting the small frame. The bones that lined the walls seemed to guide the creature. It pressed its face against the walls and ran its face against the bones as it climbed higher. When it reached the top of the cave between the light protruding from the hole and my flashlight, I got a good look at its finger details. The thing's eyes were... Well, they didn't look much like eyes at all. Rather, they resembled tumors. Two large masses that ballooned the skin covering it. I could see similar veins running underneath the translucency of the creature's eyes. It was then. I figured the thing was probably completely blind. When a small portion of sunlight hit the creature's skin, I could hear a small hiss emit within the silence of the space. I thought initially the creature had made noise, but upon seeing a thin trail of smoke rise from the skin where the sun had hit it, I discovered that it had been burnt by the sun. Sunlight was, mind you, already diluted by the canopy of trees. It was then I realized that this thing appeared like deep water fishes. Deep underwater, many marine lives have evolved to have transparent skin, so it can get nutrients from whatever small traces of sunlight made it down that far. The creature above me, however, quickly got to work patching up the hole my body created. It would grab clumps of dirt from the walls and spew a thick and frothing saliva into it before compressing it. Then it would press it against the part of the hole, like it was sculpting the closing out of clay. At one point, the sun touched its hand, causing the creature to drop some of the dirt as it hit the ground beside me. It snapped its head to the noise. I could see the lumps it had on its face, flaring up in a deep red blood color rush to the area. The skin rose and fell like a set of lungs. My body lay completely still, and my breath became still, waiting for the moment to pass. Starting to understand how the creature operated, I was curious to avoid making a noise. When what felt like hours had passed, a thing turned its attention back to the hole, and I watched my beacon of hope slowly being covered up. The beam of light became smaller and smaller until it was nothing, and the only part of the light was left was my flashlight. It seemed the artificial light did not bother the creature. Thankfully, with the hole covered up, the creature started its descent, small holes being left in the wall where claws were dug in. Carefully and slowly, I followed the movements with my flashlight keeping an eye on it. With the frame back on the floor, it started retreating from the tunnel it arrived from. The tunnel would be a tight squeeze, but something I could maneuver through. It would be plenty of room for a child or someone elderly. More gruesomely, it would be an easy fit for me if something were to relieve me of a few limbs. My flashlight traced the creature's movements as it continued to rub its face along the walls. Bones also line the side of the tunnel, though they run horizontally instead of vertically like the ones in the opening. This must be how the thing got around, using the bones to differentiate between open caverns and tunnels, maybe even using certain types of bones in specific places to create a map of sorts, a map I had no chance of trying to figure out. But I did have a map. Once the creature had gotten far enough away that I thought it would be safe, I slowly unzipped my backpack. Each unlatching tooth of the zipper sent a beat through my heart as I kept an eye on the tunnel, eyes adjusting to the darkness. As if I was playing Operation, I ever so carefully retrieved the map sitting in the backpack's pocket. The thought crossed my mind that I could try to collapse the walls around me and create a ramp of sorts, though there was no guarantee that would work, or that I just wouldn't bury myself. The walls were made of compacted dirt, but... What was behind the walls could have been too loose and by the time I managed to get enough purchase, there was no way of knowing that the creature wouldn't return before I was done. I did have a knife. I could try to fight it off. The claws would do some gnarly damage if it was violent. Not to mention, I often find if you see one animal, chances are there are others. Instead, I opened the map and rested the beam of light on it. Studying where I had fallen, and where the closest set of arrows were topside, I found a set not too far away, but it was not exactly what I needed. Instead, I opted for a further point. My mind was flooded with uncertainty and fear, but I had worked hard to not let those things get to me. That's how inexperienced people get lost or hurt. I had to keep my wits about me, no matter how bad my hands were shaking. Pulling a marker out of the same pouch I folded the map into, 
enough that I could just see two sets of arrow clusters. I was certainly making noise, but nothing as loud as when I had fallen in, which I assumed alerted the creature in the first place. I imagined being a small child or even a seasoned hunter, not looking for such a thing, falling into a hole like that, likely getting hurt and wailing out in pain, not knowing a creature like that was after you. The compacted dirt seemed to work in my favor as I started pulling myself into the tunnel. The first soil made it easy to move and seemed to dampen the noise of my advance. I know, you're probably thinking of a hundred different ways I could have gotten out, smarter and more effective ways. Even looking back, I have ideas that flooded my mind, but it's so different in the moment. You must understand just how different it is. To be an outside observer of events with a gift of hindsight, of course there was a smarter way to do it. But to be there, to have fallen in, to have seen that creature and felt that fear wash over you, I was doing my best, the best I can, and to my credit, you're hearing this story now because I managed to get myself out. It wasn't easy. My ankles still scorched whenever I needed to put pressure on them and to move forward. The caves would get tighter occasionally and have to move slower to avoid making noise. I could hear a faint dripping of water the whole time I was in the cave system. Occasionally there would be a skittering nearby, something like a trowel digging through dirt. The tunnels all lined with the same white, so many bones. Some of them were clearly from animals, while others had more grisly implications. Sometimes the white would be tainted by dark stains of crimson that had dried, almost becoming the same color as the dirt around it. The paths were twisting and branched all over the place. Sometimes I would have to contort myself until I felt my bones urging me to stop just to move through a corner. All the while I kept the map in one hand, dirt occasionally fell on it, but the compacted nature of the tunnels kept most of the grime away. As I made it through the tunnels, I would draw a line on the map to try to represent my location, keeping track of turns and directions I was heading in. Slowly but surely, I was getting closer to the other hole. As I got more confident in my movements and how to shift my weight while making minimal noise in my pace, I started to pick up. Just as I reached an intersection of the tunnel, one of the creatures appeared, their faces inches from mine. I froze instantly, sat and prayed that it would just move into a different direction. I could see it so clearly, all the blood moving through its body. The thing looked a lot more like a jellyfish than anything you'd expect to see in the woods. My body started to itch. Minutes passed by as I was watching the thing. It had a hunk of meat in its hand, sharp and jagged teeth ripping the morsel apart. It would place its jaws around the food, open and close its mouth in a rapid succession, like it was blending the food up. I could see that same frothy saliva coat the area it chewed, and it became a paste-like substance. Then the creature slurped the contents up. A disgusting foul smell accompanied the sound like a vacuum sucking up nails. I don't know if it felt my breath on it, but the thing stopped and turned towards me, cocking its head to the side. The blood in its body rushed to the eye socks, again illuminating a threatening red as it sensed something was around it. Holding my breath, I waited and prayed. Then I heard clicking. It was from deeper in a tunnel to the side of the creature. It sounded like chalk slapping together. Then the creature before me chattered its teeth as if it were shivering, producing the same noise. This told me there was definitely more than one of these things around here, and they communicate using a series of clicks almost like Morse code. Luckily for me, the communication must have been a call for attention, and the creature before me started moving to the sound of the other. Again, I waited, time ticking on as I listened to their claws getting further and further away. Once I couldn't hear them anymore and it was only the sound of dripping water, I continued forward. The sound of water got louder as I made my way through the tunnel system. I remembered hearing one aspect of the missing cases in this forest was that clothing would often be found by rivers. Bodies would go missing, but shirts and shoes would be found by running water on the map. Sure enough, there was a cluster of arrows by the lake. It took a while, God knows how long, but eventually I found an open cavern, and my flashlight reflected against a small pool of water on the ground. I let myself relax a little bit as I planned my attack. Pointing the light up, I could see where the water was falling, where the tight soil must be at its loosest. The arrows were right by the riverbank. The area was also an incline, so the walls were angled differently than the hole I fell in. 
It was still a climb, but there was more surface area to work with and less of a conclave area. Letting my muscles calm down, I mentally prepared for the next minute or two. Knowing what I had to do, and knowing that I had to do it very quickly, especially considering the knowledge that more of those creatures were down there. Who knows how many. They got around based on sounds and touch. They would know the caves well enough to find the rushing water quickly. Their next meal trying to escape wouldn't be something they could pass up. Shuffling through my bag, I retrieved a few things that would give me an edge. First, my knife. Then I pulled out an emergency flare gun. I also got a small shovel I had put in there from my last camping trip. I had a few stakes in there as well. So gathering the stakes and the rope, I went to the entrance of the opening and placed the rope across it, holding it in place with the stakes being pressed into the soil. It wouldn't hold forever, but it might slow them down, or I hoped they would confuse the feeling of this with the bones that they used to get around. With my axe in hand, knife clamped between my teeth, and a flare gun in the other, I took a sharp breath in and leapt into action. Pulling the trigger on the flare gun, a light was sent down the tunnel where it rested burning tirelessly, illuminating the dark and the ominous red glow. I chucked the axe above me as hard as I could. It was sticking into the dirt, but I could see water running down the handle of it. I was in the right spot. I didn't want to weigh myself down anymore, so I made the decision to leave the rest of my backpack behind, other than the map stuffed in my back pocket. Using the purchase I had from the slope wall caused by the incline, I dug the knife into the side. The knife wasn't nearly as effective as those creatures' claws, but with the right angle and the handle digging into my skin, it was enough. My arm stretched out and I grabbed the axe handle, quickly pulling it loose to a larger stream of water falling through. I could see a soft beam of fading sunlight peeking through. There was a clicking, an all too familiar one. It was followed by a piercing cry that rattled my confidence. Looking to the tunnel, I could see them. They were behind the flare. They weren't scared though. I could see where it had burned one of them, but instead of rushing past it, they grabbed the dirt from around them, soaked it in their saliva before dropping it onto the flare, snuffing out the flame. My heart raced. What I told you earlier about fight or flight? This time I refused to freeze. Another solid throw of the axe loosened more dirt, clumps falling to the ground and a steady stream of water rushing in. The creatures advanced, at least four of them from what I could see, climbing over each other just to get to me. Their faces pressed against the rope and they'd turn their heads trying to follow it before smacking into the wall. The dirt had cleared enough though. I knew I could make it. Holding the knife and the axe, I plunged them into the wall, digging the tips of my shoes into the side as hard as I could, pulling myself up as I reached and grabbed a handful of dirt around the opening. Desperately, I clawed at the edges, pulling down, letting an increasing quantity of water spill in. I watched the creatures, and to my surprise, they had stopped. I thought they had come at me with everything, throwing their bodies at me mindlessly, but instead, they grabbed dirt from around them and started closing the tunnel. The water started reaching them, but by the time it would have gotten to them, the hole I climbed through was gone. I clung to the wall, shocked, almost upset that my big action hero plan didn't play out like I was hoping. The things just cut their losses. With the chamber filling up with water, I floated up and was eventually able to just climb out of this anticlimactic spot. When I was out, I just sat there, going over everything in my head. But all things must move forward. I couldn't just sit there. I especially didn't want to be around at sundown in case these things were going to come out and move more freely. It was getting dark by the time I was almost out, though. The sky, a soft gray above me, scattered with clouds. A surreal feeling washed over me as I reached the parking lot, believing what I had just experienced. I watched the clouds drifting. I almost was not surprised when one of the bright stars I was watching seemed to start drifting around, back and forth, blinking all the while, as if it knew I could see it, like it was putting on a show. Then it just zipped off, and like the creatures below my feet, it was gone. Climbing into the car, I felt the engine hum to life, and I started my way home. Yes, I did tell the authorities about it, showed them the map, that the arrows were indicative of trap sites, that there were likely many, many more unmarked graves. But, surprisingly, they didn't seem to take me too seriously while promising me they'd investigate it. I'd like to go back, destroy all of the openings I knew of. But, what good would that do? Those things would just make new ones, unmarked ones. 
That's how they live. It's how they hunt. They're not going to just stop. Maybe there's something I can do. I don't know. Still working on that thought process. I don't think putting a sign that says, Don't go into the woods, subterranean monsters trying to trap you, would keep many people away. By now, you might have been having the same thought I did when driving home. That while those tunnels and creatures might explain the strange disappearances within that national park in specific, it sounds nothing like what I experienced as a child. No lost time, nothing. And maybe that's the problem. For so long, I've been trying to find one singular cause for missing persons lost between the trees. Maybe there isn't one. Maybe out there are several different threats lingering through the tree line. Maybe each forest has its own. That's why these cases can be so tough. They're varied in happenstance, but I'm not going to stop looking. I'm not going to stop pushing back, and maybe one day I find the reason I got lost in the woods all those years ago. Not for a while, though. I need some rest, and I have some phone calls to make. I need some time just to be thankful that I made it out alive. I know where the missing 411 are going.